Hey everyone and welcome back to MedBros. Today I'm going to be going over multiple choice strategies and specifically all the things that work for me and I try to keep in mind as I'm taking a multiple choice test. You might already know some of these, but hopefully there are some things that you can incorporate into your strategies from this video. Anyways, with all of that said, let's just get into the first tip. So my first tip is to strategically use your time. A lot of people are kind of confused on what pace they should take. Should they try to speed through all the questions and then check their answers three times over or should they go at a moderate pace? From my experience, what works best is working at a comfortable or even slightly slow pace if time allows it when taking your exam. Take time to answer each question to the best of your ability and make sure that you're reading every answer choice for every question. For easy questions, you can just read all the answer choices and then quickly pick the right answer. But for uncertain questions or questions that you think might be a little more tricky, what you want to actually do is eliminate each answer choice as you read it down to the last two. And then rather than picking whichever one seems right, you really want to focus on which one sounds wrong. I've learned that this strategy works much better than trying to just find the right answer in a tricky question. And that's just because it's much harder to prove a certain answer is right versus proving an answer is wrong. That You can usually approach that from multiple different ways and I found that it's usually much easier. The benefit of this slow, comfortable pace is you're better able to dissect each question, which is especially important on difficult exams. You're less likely to make careless mistakes and as you, if you read each answer choice, which is what you should be doing with this pace, you can use the information in those answer choices to help answer other questions. And to make the best use of your time, as you're going through the exam, you want to mark any question that you're unsure of or that you might have gotten wrong and come back to those first when you're checking the test and then after that check the rest of the test. A pro tip is to use two different types of marking. So one marking like a circle would be you're just unsure of your answer and then a square would be you're completely lost. So I usually like to create this two-tiered system and it helps me prioritize what I need to do when I'm checking my test. For the marked questions, you should be focused on checking the reasoning behind your answer and for all the other questions that you haven't marked, just the regular answers, you should be particularly focusing on careless mistakes. And regarding checking answers, you 100% should check answers if you have time, but don't try to rush through your exam so you have time to check your answers. My second tip is to not pick the average Joe answer. So what is the average Joe answer? It's basically the answer choice that the teacher plans and wants you to pick if you're not carefully paying attention or you haven't studied. And unfortunately, Joe always ends up picking it. So for example, if there are calculations in a question, and everything is in feet, but the answer choices are in yards, you need to make sure at the very end to convert your answer into yards. And if you don't, you pick the average Joe answer without paying careful attention. Another form of this is not answering the direct question being asked. For example, if a question asks, how much of this block is not gold? And the question is designed to give you the answer in how much of this block is gold, you need to convert that percentage at the last step. So if you calculate 45% is gold, you need to make sure to remember that 55% is not gold. And I know this basically tests if you're paying attention, but you really do need to look out for this because for some reason teachers love this kind of stuff. One thing that really helps to avoid this is to make sure you read the exact question before you pick an answer. So you want to go back and if there's a long passage, it's usually the last sentence which is asking you the question, and you want to go back and read that question again. You don't have to read the whole entire block, just read the exact question and make sure you're answering the right thing. A pro tip for this is answers that are inverses that make up a whole, etc. Those answer choices are suspicious. So for example, if you have like five degrees, 120 degrees, 240 degrees, and 300 degrees, you should be immediately noting, hmm, 120 and 240 add up to 360 degrees, which make up a whole. So maybe you're picking C when the answer was B or something like that. After a lot of practice, your brain will automatically start to pick up on these things, but at first you really need to take some time and compare the answer choices to see how they relate. Third, you want to think about which specific concept a question is testing. 
So for example, if you have a question, a scientific experiment results in A, a rejection of a hypothesis, B, proving a hypothesis, C, blah, D, blah, blah. Basically, you wanna go back and think, what does the test maker want you to know? And here the test maker wants you to know that you can't really prove a hypothesis. You're more rejecting or supporting different ideas. An easy way to realize which concept the question is testing is to approach a question not from what you want to pick, but rather from what the test maker wants you to pick. My fourth tip is to creatively view the question in a larger context. For example, if a question asks what type of joint is the elbow, and you're given a choice of saddle, hinge, uh, sliding joints, and ball and socket, you can find that the answer is hinge by thinking, hmm, what kind of motion is the elbow making? And you can physically do that on yourself. And you'll realize it's kind of like a door, kind of like a door hinge. And so creatively viewing the question and using whatever tools you have available, either physically, which isn't often, but more often mentally. So approach the question from as many different perspectives or angles as you can. You can even think, what would be the consequences if this answer choice was true? So for a question that asks, water is in the frozen state at 60 degrees Fahrenheit, true or false? You can kind of think, hmm, if that was true, then water in my room, if I'm just chilling in my room, the water next to me might be frozen. And that just kind of doesn't make sense. So you can get the right answer from thinking about things in many different ways and in many different contexts. There's a lot of advice out there on multiple choice strategies that tell you to pick C if you're confused or to pick false because it's right more of the time or something or all of the above. And that's all nonsense. What you actually wanna do is find trends in what your specific test maker does more often. So if your test maker, you find that they're picking all of the above a lot, then that is more likely to be an answer. Obviously, this should not be the primary way to answer any question. You should try to use good old reasoning and then this can help guide your answers if you're unsure. But I think overall seeing what the test maker or your teacher does more often is far more effective than a general principle for all tests like pick C. Okay, so those were the broad tips. So here are some more specific ones, but I think that these are equally important in specific contexts. Absolutes and answers like always are suspicious. And grammatically incorrect answers, those are also suspicious. More qualified, longer answers tend to be right more often. If two answer choices are essentially the same with no subtle differences in context, then you can eliminate both of them because you obviously can't have two right answers. In an order of events type question, if there are answer choices that deviate in only one switch or one difference, usually one of those is your answer choice. So to clarify what I mean, let's use an example. If a question asks, what is the correct order? A, mix, heat up, add compound X, add compound Y, B, mix, heat up, add compound Y, add compound X. Since there's only one difference between A and B, that's likelier to be your answer. Regarding changing answers, all of that stick with your first choice no matter what, or always change your answer, I don't know what people are saying, that's all basically crap. What you actually wanna do is just use whichever answer has better reasoning. If you have better reasoning for your new answer choice, pick that. And if it's weak reasoning and your first answer choice had stronger reasoning behind it, stick with your first answer. Long answers with most things correct, but one part obviously wrong, tend to be the incorrect answer. Don't immediately discount unfamiliar answers. It's true that it's not likely to be the answer if you studied well, but don't immediately just cross it off. You wanna think maybe that this is something you needed to extrapolate from, maybe it's something you missed in your studies, or maybe it's something that should be familiar to you, but it's worded a little differently. So if you studied well, it's probably not the answer, but consider it for a bit. Sometimes students overthink and analyze a little too much, and that leads them to pick the wrong answer. So to avoid this, you wanna look at your test maker and see how much they expect you to extrapolate. Like for the MCAT for a standardized test, for instance, the answer choice is usually something that follows a broader principle rather than working in very specific situations. 
by looking at your teacher's tests, you should be able to see if you're expected to extrapolate a lot or not. If you need to qualify your answer and it only works in very specific situations, chances are that's probably not the right answer. And lastly, there's a lot of information stored in your brain that you're not conscious of. And that is actually, that intuition is actually really important in taking a multiple choice test, especially if you study the material a lot. So to trigger this, what I like to think of is, hmm, if I got this test back, which answer choice could I envision getting wrong? And that usually leads my intuition to help me pick the correct answer. Okay, so that was a lot of information to digest. Taking multiple choice tests is an important skill that will definitely result in an increase in your grades. Incorporating these strategies is definitely really hard and it's gonna take a lot of practice. You wanna get your test back and analyze what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong, how to improve multiple choice strategies so you're not making mistakes that could be avoided. I wanted to make this video because I've spent so much time analyzing tests and seeing what works and what doesn't. And also a lot of the multiple choice guides out there are not too good and a lot of them give very iffy advice like always pick C if you're unsure. I hope this multiple choice strategy guide helps you better tackle multiple choice tests in the future. If you enjoyed this video, please check out my other videos or subscribe if you wanna see videos in the future and leave a comment below and let me know what you think. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.